Benedicta tu e mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostrae. Amen. Greetings, good morning, and happy Lord's Day. Uh, I'm showing you a postcard from the Cathedral of St. George in uh, Lebanon, which I had uh, tucked into my uh, Orthodox study Bible. And the uh, Latin statement that you just heard me say uh, is a petition to Mary. It's the Hail Mary, the Ave Maria. And it asks Mary for one specific thing. It says, Ora pro nobis, pray for us. And so I want to talk about the idea of, of the departed praying for us, right? The, the, what is this based on? Is this permissible? And, and what it's like from a biblical perspective, because that comes up quite a bit. So I want to talk about that. The departed saints, you know, can they pray for us? Can we ask them to pray for us? And so I want to look at that, like I said, from a biblical pr perspective, but because I'm doing this from a Catholic perspective, I'm not going to use my uh, Orthodox uh, Bible if it's okay with you. I mean, we can use any translation you would like, but uh, just for the sake of uh, this exercise, I'm going to use my old beat-up uh, New American Bible. Uh, this is a Catholic translation, and I'm just going to try to really quickly look at a few verses, all right? Uh, which I guess we could say pro and con. And the first text to turn to, I think it's uh, perhaps the text that comes up most when uh, the question of whether, you know, we can petition Mary, ask Mary to pray for us. The one that comes up the most in my uh, experience is uh, in First Timothy, second chapter, the fifth verse. So First Timothy two five, right, which declares there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man. Or here it says God and the human race, uh, that being Christ Jesus. So Christ is the one mediator between God and man, and so people, those who want to polemicize against this. Uh, practice will say you're setting up Mary as a mediator between you and God when the one mediator is uh, Christ. And I'll, I can deal with this verse in uh, more details in another video, but uh, just for now, just as a sort of preliminary point, I want to note that ironically in the same chapter, right at the top of the chapter, right at the beginning of First Timothy 2, it says, first of all, I ask, this is Paul saying this, he says, I ask that supplications, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be offered for everyone. So Paul himself is asking that others pray for, you know, <laughs> for basically everyone. And this is important because then it begs the question, using the sort of logic that was employed, was Paul setting up other people as intercessors between them and God, between those who would be prayed for? And God. And so with that in mind, I'd like to turn to the end of the book of James, the uh, the fifth chapter of James. Because in James 5.16, there's this line where it says, aside from uh, confessing uh, your sins, it also says, pray for one another that you may be healed. The fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful, right? So the... the the prayers of righteous persons are valuable indeed, right? And so, I mean, I think every Christian understands this, even Christians who polemicize against the practice of asking the saints to pray for us. They understand that there's value in righteous people praying for you. They might ask their pastor to pray for them. They might ask their grandmother to pray for them. They might ask for someone who they consider particularly uh, pious, I guess. I don't want to say but righteous in their church to pray for them, etc., right? So, the people who do that, they understand fully well that asking your neighbor or your grandmother or your pastor or whatever to pray for you is not setting that person up as an intercessor between you and God, right? So therefore, this polemic sort of falls flat. But then the question becomes, well, or, or then the objection turns to this idea that, well, you can ask the living to pray for you, but you can't ask someone who's passed away to pray for you, right? They can't pray for you. That's ridiculous. And that's not biblical, they might say. And what I would say is, first off, there's an artificial barrier that's placed there saying that the the living can pray for us, but the dead can't pray for us, the departed can't pray for us. I would wonder what that uh, what the support is for that barrier rather than just assuming it, or is that an artificial restriction? But nonetheless, I wanted to very quickly look at a couple of verses, and then I'm just going to close this video out and head off to church, so I hope you don't mind. And I'm going to turn to, first and foremost, 
and we'll go to, uh, oops, we'll get to there in a second. Let's go to the book of Maccabees. Second Maccabees. And I understand that some people don't have Second Maccabees as part of their uh, their particular Bibles. Uh, but you have to understand the, it is part of Catholic and Orthodox Bibles. So uh, at least for Catholic and Orthodox, if we're going to be discussing, uh, you know, this practice from a biblical perspective, it's going to involve uh, texts uh, which are in Catholic and Orthodox Bibles. And so if I could just move my little prayer card here, we're in uh, Second Maccabees. The fourth chapter, and I just want to note really quickly that that text covers the death of Onias, of the priest Onias, and uh, you'll see here it says Second Maccabees four thirty four, and it talks at the end of the verse it talks about him being put to death, right? And of course you can check this in other translations, uh, but I just want to set that up as a as a point that by the time you get to the fourth chapter of Second Maccabees, uh, Onias has been killed at the end of the fourth chapter. Now, if we can, and uh, <laughs> I'm using uh, prayer cards of the Black Madonna for uh, my uh, uh, bookmarks here, but uh, whatever the case, with that in mind, now let's go to 2 Maccabees 15, because in that text, there's a vision that one has, and it's about, uh, so we're talking like 11 chapters uh, later on in the book, and in this vision, one thing that the person sees in verse 12, so this is 2 Maccabees 15, 12, what he saw was Onias, the former high priest, a good and virtuous man, modest in appearance, gentle in manners, distinguished in speech, and trained from childhood in every virtuous practice, was praying with outstretched arms for the whole of the Jewish community. So in other words, after Onias died, he was praying for the people. So it seems that from a biblical perspective, it is plausible that the dead can pray. And uh, with that in mind, I'd look, like to look at one other text. Uh, people might roll their eyes at this one, but I find it interesting nonetheless. This is uh, the very beginning of Jeremiah, the 15th chapter. There's this interesting statement, and I fully appreciate that this can be interpreted a couple of different ways, right? But it states that the Lord said to me, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my heart would not turn toward this people, send them away from me, right? Now, there's two ways to look at this. I understand that some would want to say, oh, that shows that people can't intercede, but that's not what I think that's stating. I think that this text is working within the framework of which intercession from the departed is possible, right? Onias can pray for you and stuff like that and pray for certain people, but there can be a certain generation that's so wicked that even if it was Moses and Samuel praying for them, God might be so, quote-unquote, angry with them that he would not even accept the intercessory prayers of Moses and Samuel. But tacitly within that is this logic that if the generation was less uh, wicked, if there was another generation, another group of people, that sort of intercession would be possible, and intercession from Moses and Samuel would be particularly valuable, you know? And so that's all. I just wanted to throw that out there just as a, a couple of thoughts. I do think this is an open question. I mean, ultimately, I'm going to say that, you know, from a Catholic perspective or an Orthodox perspective, that the church would be the final arbiter in settling this question if we're going to continue to dispute about it. But I do th just wanted to share that, you know, from a biblical perspective, there are verses which seem to loan themselves to the idea. And uh, on a closing note, I just wanted to show one more thing from my... Uh, Orthodox Study Bible. This is somewhat, <laughs> and I, you could show this in any Bible, uh, but in Luke 1, uh, towards the end of the first chapter of Luke, right, you have uh, Mary's uh, statement after she's uh, met with Elizabeth, and a particularly interesting statement, which in my opinion isn't discussed enough, uh, but Nonetheless, I find it very interesting. It's in Luke 148, right? Mary says, you know, she, well, actually, of course, you could start at 46, where Mary says, you know, the famous line, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in, my, in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. And then she says, this is again, Luke 148, for behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. Uh, I might discuss this in more detail in a future video. I'm thinking about doing a video on the rosary. And uh, so that's an interesting verse. But it, an interesting question is, what does that statement mean? And how is it fulfilled? All generations will call Mary blessed. That's an interesting question. Like, think about when this was first penned. Because uh, this line only appears in Luke. You know, when Luke was first penned, it was probably a very small marginalized community which was holding to this text. 
So it probably seemed quite boastful. Or when Mary herself said it, you know, she might have been just some Jewish peasant girl from the perspective of the community. And, and it's, it's, I imagine if others heard this statement when she said it, some of them might have been tempted to find it a bit, uh, a bit of an exaggeration, right? All generations are going to call this first century peasant girl blessed, you know? And yet, in almost every country all over the world, day after day, year after year, century after century, generation after generation, Catholics and Orthodox have said, you know, have, have recited uh, the angelic salutation to Mary, right? Just at the beginning of this video, I said it myself, Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, et benedictus fructus ventris Jesus. Okay, so uh, that's interesting. I think when Orthodox pray the uh, the angelic salutation, and when Catholics recite the Hail Mary, they're fulfilling this verse, as for centuries upon centuries, we've been fulfilling this verse, this declaration, this prediction, that all generations will call Mary blessed. And on that note, I'll close this video here. I'm going to head off to church. I hope you forgive uh, the, the sort of raw and sloppy nature of this video. I might uh, get into this in more detail, but I look forward to your thoughts. Have a great day. Have a great Lord's Day, and God bless.